trail, but with Warren by my side, I felt pressure, mostly positive pressure, to keep going. We were two people who shared the same questions. What was my capacity for endurance? Was it good enough to set a fastest known time? And could I outperform all the men who had come before me? Because I could still drag one foot in front of the other, I knew that I had not yet found those answers. Warren's watchful eye held me accountable to this very personal and painful scientific query. A week earlier, I had set off from the summit of Katahdin with a spring in my step. I descended just over five miles on a steep, boulder-strewn path to meet Warren and my husband, Brew, at the base of the mountain. Lots of folks wished me well or said they believed in me, but these were the only two men willing to drive to the heart of Maine, a place filled with black flies and bogs, to begin this experiment by my side. With each road crossing, Warren and Brew marked my progress. You made it here this fast, said Brew. You are this far behind the record, said Warren. You have this far to the next road, said Brew. You should leave now to get there, said Warren. After hiking 150 miles in three days, our team arrived at the banks of the Kennebec River. Trying to use every minute, I decided to ford the river. Alternatively, I would need to wait one hour to take advantage of a canoe ferry. Steered by a seasonal employee of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, the canoe ferries afford hikers a safe, mostly dry, transport across the dam-controlled artery. Warren had crossed the river numerous times on foot, so I followed his sturdy calves into the water. His strong legs moved sideways against the forceful current until they disappeared. Then his waist waded past the white ripples on the surface of the water. Soon, he was immersed up to his armpits in the cold, flowing channel. I kept my eyes on Warren and struggled to keep my toes anchored to the large, smooth stones at my feet. Breathless from fear and the chill of the water, I tried to stay in his wake. My sports bra changed from a light purple to a dark violet as I forged deeper and farther into the river. I listened to Warren as he voiced a steady and concise refrain. Feet down, feet down, feet down. I repeated the chorus in a murmuring echo, hoping to drown out the profanity swimming through my head. I noticed goosebumps on my skin as my stomach muscles rose above the surface of the water. Soon my thighs slashed through the dark grips of the kinnebec, and after a harrowing and invigorating 20-minute crossing, I stood dripping wet on the opposite shore. My eyes turned to meet Warren's approving gaze. I smiled and let out a half-whimper, half-giggle. Warren responded with a deep, bellowing laugh. Then he struck a pose and shouted, I may have the face of a 61-year-old and the belly of a couch potato, but I've still got the legs of a wild river man. Here stood my fairy man, the person who had taught me the difference between stopping and quitting, the man who believed that I could be the first woman to set the overall record on the Appalachian Trail, and the individual who showed me how to keep my feet down and not get swept away by the current. The year 1973 marked the beginning of the end of the Vietnam War. It was the year of the controversial Roe versus Wade verdict in the Supreme Court. The Watergate scandal infiltrated the ranks of the White House. Warren Doyle was 23 years old. He was aware of the civil unrest, and he was becoming a proponent of social justice. As a child, he had witnessed his father, a veteran of World War II, struggle to find work and support his family. As an undergrad, Warren spent a summer volunteering in the mountains of Jamaica. Most of the locals there lived in corrugated metal shacks. When his mother came to visit, he refused to stay in the hotel with her. The disparity between the wealth of the tourists and poverty of the natives was so unsettling to Warren 
that he preferred to spend the night with the homeless street.